Thanks so much, Claudio, and thanks to Art Basel for inviting us to do the salon and, of course, inviting us to do our hidden oasis in the Nova section. Um, so I guess to start out, we were, were asked by Art Basel to come up with an artist project for a little spot within the Nova section that was sort of hidden, nestled within the other booths. There was going to be a bar in there as well, so we were just trying to think about how to make the most interesting space and situation and project. Um, as we were thinking about that, we were thinking about how this particular art fair is sited in Miami and how often when you're at the art fair, you don't see any sunlight, you're here all day, it's only air conditioning, only like these bright lights. So we decided to create a situation that brought some of the outdoors in. We decided to make a, a, a jungle and we got a lot of plants from the Redlands Nursery and we created this immersive environment that was, would allow a visitor, once they stumbled upon it, to become just hidden in an oasis. So uh, the project of our title is Paradise Working Title. Um, we love the idea of it being a working title, so as Paradise is never really a, a finished thing. Do you want to elaborate on the title, Jim? Not really. I was just going to just add, saying that um, yeah. we kind of created our dream backyard in some way. And oftentimes people ask us, like, why we live in Miami. And in a lot of ways, this is a visual representation of, of why we live here. Yeah. So when you're walking through the Nova section, all of a sudden you might notice that there's a place that doesn't have a label, doesn't say what it is, but you just see this hallway. Um, as you walk in, there's these structures made out of metal that David made. Um, and as you walk in further, you see this giant sculpture by Jim Drain made out of file cabinets that have been opened like a sardine can and colored grab bars. And as you walk in, you see the side of the sculpture and all of a sudden you realize once you get beyond this sculpture that it's not just the sculpture at the end of the hallway. It leads you into this oasis. Um, these tabletop sculptures um, are artworks by myself, as is um, this uh, snakeskin structure. And you can see also the back of Jim's sculpture. Um, this is another tabletop with uh, digital prints on silk that are covered with orchids and other plants. And then there's a structure dividing the space even further, made out of grab bars, covered in camouflage with some orchids upon it. So it's sort of like a maze. First you go in, you see Jim's sculpture. Once you realize you can sneak around that, you see this other space. And then once you further sneak around this structure with the walkers, there's a bar with the backdrop is a, a 17 foot long painting by me. So I guess we thought first, before we go further into what the bar is, we would talk a little bit about our own work and how we got to this place where we were making a full immersive installation that encompassed a bar and becoming a social space out of our own individual practices. So this is an image from my most recent exhibition, um, Lay of the Land at the University of Florida in Gainesville. And it came out of a project where I was in the Everglades National Park for one month. I had a residency there through the ARI program. And I really just spent the month hiking, walking around, thinking, really just starting a new body of work. And as I was there, I was really interested in how invasive species were taking over in many ways, whether they were plant or animal. Within one area, they were restoring, they were pulling out all the plants and scraping the earth to the bedrock in order to allow like seeds to blow in and plants to kind of naturally restore the environment once ec the extra soil and fertilizer from past farming days was, was gone. And additionally, this might be a more known thing, they have a, a really huge problem with pythons. Um, people who have their pet and get sick of it eventually have let them go into nature, bringing them back to the wild, but it's the wrong wild. And they've taken over in a really tough way and are eating a lot of the mammals. So in doing that, that's sort of how I arrived at um, this snakeskin sculpture, just thinking about invasive species. But also, you know, I'm very much in love with the Florida landscape, the nature here. My, my father was a botanist, so I've really grown up with it. So this exhibition was kind of coming out of a lot of that. But I was making making these artworks that were part of a more industrial landscape where chain link fences housed digital prints on silk, 
digital prints becoming dresses on leather, all sorts of things. And it also involved a lot of performance. I worked with dancers to create a response to my project and my video. And there was a performance on the opening where they were also wearing these dresses made out of my photos printed on digital, digitally on silk. And often these imageries would relate back to the images on the wall. That's a photograph on leather behind her. And she's wearing the same photograph on silk as she collapses on the ground. So, you know, my own practice, I've been really moving more towards these performative, interactive artworks that aren't, aren't just individual objects, but also come out of an experience and involve a much bigger picture. So for me, when we were asked to do this space that involved a more immersive environment, having a bar in the back, it just seemed fantastic, a, a really great way to incorporate the kind of more performative aspects that we're interested in, other people who we're excited about, and move that forward. So next is David Andrew Tasman. And um, my background is in architecture. And um, when Jim and Naomi uh, invited me to work with them, I was very excited by the premise which they had proposed of um, paradise here at our Basel Miami Beach and their notion of focusing on aspects of Miami often overlooked in uh, certain times of the year. A lot of what I helped them with uh, was sort of visualizing a spatial manifestation of their ideas. Um, Naomi's work uh, which I love, uh, deals a lot with nature. And um, Jim's work um, in its appropriation of industrial, often familiar materials as it's recontextualized, I thought really for me brought up issues I'm interested in and um, how the relationship between modernism and the natural has changed and evolved. And I think if you've been in the space uh, you really see a sort of inversion at work, uh, which is rare in an environment like this. Uh, some of the images that led to my involvement uh, working with Jim and Naomi um, are these spatial sculptures, uh, architectures without the constraints of site or context or client, uh, seeing architecture as a spatial practice. Um, where we can begin to delineate space in a way that augments reality, that manifests a sort of digital experience or virtual experience, rather than inside of, um, of a network, but, but outside um, in physical space. So these, these are our physical metal mesh sculptures uh, that you're seeing here. And Jim Drain. This is a work I developed with R. Peterson, and um, I brought this one up just as David and I were discussing this space. Um, just how one feels within this space, I think, was important, and I think this work sort of recognizes that of how a, someone, a viewer, moves throughout this installation. Um, these pinwheels are rotating with. Uh, through box fans that blow onto the back of them. Um, next image. And I think something I responded to David's mesh structures too was um, bringing in this camouflage that had this sort of similar like visual language. Um, so I, this is a work from a couple years ago too. And then this is just a visual representation of a project at Vizcaya, um, which was, there was an event there. Um, and I think what we wanted to bring is sort of like this kind of joyful space that you know, was created with the plants and, um, and sort of like this, um, a space people can come in and just sort of like feel like they were in this totally different kind of place um, where they could just, that was sort of separate or removed from the, the art fair itself. Um, maybe I'll just talk about this. So as David and I started talking about how to sort of um, 
synthesize our three practices. We're concerned about, I mean, we wanted the bar to be sort of like this gathering place. And so how that was going to happen between the three of us was um, the, the place where we started from and where we ended up now, I think, was an interesting kind of evolution. So this just shows like one of the preliminary images that David, David made for us. Um, and I just love this image of, uh, this is also sort of like midway through as we were thinking, um, we were talking about having a canopy over people, just sort of like to have it be kind of this engrossing space. And I, I love sort of like the sort of festive atmosphere that this creates. Um, maybe I'll pass it to you, maybe. So as, as it evolved, um, the images we showed you in the beginning are what it turned into in the end. So it's been a really wonderful conversation to kind of figure out how to make the space best work with, within all our needs and our visions. And, you know, the most important, perhaps, thing about it beyond the look of the space and the feel of the space is how to a activate the space. So we came up with a s schedule of performances or interactions or whatever some of them are, events. <laughs> and the way we came to this was through really thinking about another project that Jim and I have been doing for the last couple of years here in Miami. Um, we're both based in Miami, David's based in New York, and Jim and I are co-directors of an artist-run alternative art space called Bass Visitor Invitational in, in downtown Miami. And one of the projects that we do that's been really successful, it has a great Knight Foundation grant, a grant from the Cultural Affairs in the state of Florida. It's called Weird Miami. And we commission artists to do bus tours to different sites around the city. And that came out of a, our desire to let people really know how different voices see this city, that it's not just South Beach, that it's, it's really a much more interesting, fascinating place. So through our explorations with that, we're, we're very invested in bringing different voices into a contemporary art context. So we started off on our first day with Clive Chung doing coconuts, the next day with Lauren Pulitzer, who run, does a food catering called Meals That Heals, but she also got a Knight Foundation grant to put on meals that raise funds for art projects. So she's someone who works with food, but in a way that's really supporting the arts. And next, we had a poetry reading by Scott Cunningham, who's a poet based here in Miami, who also is the director of the O Miami Poetry Festival, which is a yearly event, month-long event, bringing poetry to, trying to bring a poem to every person in Miami. I think that's their goal. Um, and then we brought down Jesse Gold, a dancer from New York City, who's originally from Miami, um, to do a dance performance in the space. Nathaniel Sandler, who's a Miami-based poet, to do a poetry reading. Jason Hedges, who is a Miami-based artist who works with food in his practice to catch a fish the day of the fair and then make ceviche in the booth as a performance. Then Annalisa Teachworth from New York did a performance. And today, after this, from 3 to 6 p.m. will be Club Nuts, which is a brainchild of Scott and Tyson Reader from Chicago, and their representative, Ross, will be leading Club Nuts with us today, and you guys are welcome to come over with us afterwards to tell some jokes and have a drink. So we wanted to just show you some of the wonderful things that were happening that throughout the week. It's been really interesting because it has been a secret, so if you find it, you find it, and we're now the secret's out, and we'll, we'll tell you where it is. But on our first day at the opening reception, we brought in Clive Chung to cut open coconuts. So it was a really incredible, wonderful time where everybody who walked in was able to just get a coconut. We had 200, so if you were the lucky first 200 people to come, you, you got a coconut. So it was just so much fun to have everybody in there. Oh, and then we had a, one of the other secrets within the secret bar is we had a secret bench, which was hidden behind a bunch of palm trees. So here I was having some uh, office time with Ryan McGinley back in the, uh, and we were calling it our office uh, as well. But, you know, people were just having so much fun, and that just made us really happy. Everyone who, when they came in, they were like, wow, I'm exhausted, and now I found this oasis, and I can just sit down, recuperate, and have the strength to just look at everything with fresh eyes again in the fair. So that was Lauren Pulitzer um, making her demo of food, our friends Jane and Don. And, you know, what was really cool, too, is just seeing how kids and families were also really interacting in this space. 
that, you know, I think it's so wonderful that people are bringing their whole families to the art fair to really look at things, but I know kids, you know, their attention span might not last as long. <laughs> so here's a poetry reading by Scott. I love that, like, there was no clear place for a stage in here, but everybody found their place. So here he just stood up on a bench in front of the camouflage and started reading. I have some stills from uh, Jessie Gold's performance. She was a cat burglar and brought out a ladder and was sort of peeking over the edges and moving things around, crawling around on the walls. And I mean, she's just the most incredible dancer. And she's another person who really interestingly, oh, she's climbing in Jim's sculpture. <laughs> and here's her very cat burglar pose. Um, she's another person who, you know, when, one of the things that we're really interested in with the other people who we work with are people who work in multiple platforms. So Jessie is a, a dancer, but she also runs this incredible bar in New York City called Cafe Dancer. Because so many people who work on these lines where there's not necessarily a sellable object, you have to really find a way to kind of exist. And as a dancer, many people who are really intense contemporary dance people have to find other jobs. So she was a bartender for years, but she and some other dancer friends opened up a bar called Cafe Dancer, and it's a great watering hole where, you know, a lot of art people hang out there now, like Rena Spalling tends to do their parties there and everybody else. But, you know, it's become a really site for community there in New York as well. Um, here's Nathaniel Sandler reading poems in front of the snakeskins and more visitors to the fair in our booth, more family time. And then we had a performance by Annalisa Teachworth from New York where she, um, she spent hours being wrapped up in these white ribbons, tied up around her, and then was wheeled out and had a sign just saying to pull ribbon. So the crowd came and gradually untied her. And at the end, she like dedicated the performance to Mandela. It was really, really beautiful and more people hanging out. So we just had a wonderful, I like this one, I'll leave it on this one for now. Um, we just had a really great time taking what we do as artists and creating not just a place for our own individual artworks, but creating a context for it. You know, because Jim and I, living here in Miami, people often ask us, why, why do you live here? Like, why not in New York? Because we're in New York pretty regularly as well. And there's just these, it, there's this room for expansion. There's room for a different kind of experimenting and crossing lines that are much wider and harder to access and different mediums, different people. And, and this is stuff that we, we really believe in and find, find a really interesting to play with. Do you have any more to say about that, Jen, maybe? No, that was really well said. <laughs> Um, but I, it's great to see these images of the people in the space. I think in the end, like that was what it was all about for us was like having these really special events and sort of creating the space for, for that to happen. Well, maybe this is a good time to open up for questions. I see some faces that I've seen in the bar. I don't know if anybody has uh, thoughts or questions or anything more they'd like to know. Um, you may have answered this, but had you all been working together and were approached? Well, David, I mean, I was introduced to David through our uh, friend, Miles Huston, who does this space called No More Games, who's an artist who runs a gallery in, in Brooklyn. And so it was the first time that we had worked with David, um, but Naomi and I had, have been running this art space in, in Miami together for eight years or so. But it was the first time we actually showed our artwork together in the same space. Yeah, that was a really interesting thing for us because, you know, what we've collaborated on in the past didn't involve making art, it involved curating, it involved producing projects. So, you know, our studios are next to each other, so we see our work in the same proximity, but I've never really seen my work properly installed in the same space as his. So it, that was really exciting for me to just see how, 
how it was awesome. <laughs> so, I don't know. Because one thing we've found between the two of us is we share a similar color palette. But how we work is incredibly different. Like I usually work in a more photo-based practice. I make paintings and I make performances. Jim primarily works in sculpture, although he also makes some two-dimensional works and has done performance stuff as well. But it's just really interesting how often when work is very different, but when it's sort of coming from a sort of similar philosophical point of view, which is I think we're both very interested in looking at the world very critically, but also very lovingly. Like, we, I think we both have a lot of empathy towards contradiction. And I think one of the things that's especially interesting in Miami is how there are so many contradictions. And even just, you know, back to the, the artwork with the snakeskins, like, you know, spending a month in the Everglades, being interested in, like, invasive species, it also started making me think about, well, these invasive species that are pythons are also become a product for like a luxury handbag. So there's this line of like, when is something invasive? When is it like a $3,000 purse, you know? And, and like, how do you kind of like negotiate this interest of like nature, preservation, but like navigating in a world that is very much constructed through the lens of luxury and aspiration and like finding a space to kind of play with these contradictions and like really dig deep into that but you know through an empathetic gaze and not a like putting putting anyone down gaze you know it's like how do you how do you understand that we all live in this world and we all have these kind of needs and we have to move forward with different symbols but how do you deconstruct them and put them back together again in a way that is really interesting but goes beyond Hi, I'm Ernie. Uh, I'm an artist here from Miami. Uh, and I just wanted to expand on what you just mentioned. Uh, I, I took that, uh, the Burmese python thing. Mm -hmm. I was like, when does something invasive become native, right? Yeah. So that's, uh, that was sort of where I was coming from, being that you guys are from New York, and then I'm a native. Like, you guys are my handbags. <laughs> But the, the bar was really awesome. I did actually find it, and it was definitely very much a relief. So thank you. It was successful. Thanks so much. Cool. I, I actually am a Miami native, <laughs> born and bred. All right. I'm both. I'm both the python and the handbag. <laughs> actually, I think if you're here in Miami for three weeks, you become a native. Yeah. So I'm halfway there then. Yeah. But it's, I mean, even that's really interesting. You know, it's like when... You know, like, like what you're saying about like people coming in and becoming this thing, like I think us living here have that sort of same view of it. You know, it's like when, when does this international audience kind of expand upon what's already here? When is it just like you might as well be on a cruise ship in the ocean? And that's part of why we wanted to, to create the space that we did, that to, be, to really anchor it in something that's more than just a convention center that happens to be in Miami Beach. And how do you, how do you just sort of give a context for, for work? I mean, you know, the White Cube is amazing, and I'm a, a complete, completely devoted to it most of the time, but I also like to push it and see, like, how can you create a different way to view art? How can you find a different way to look at your own work and get other people to look at your work. So, yeah, so thanks for that comment. Well, if there, if there aren't more questions, maybe I'll talk a little bit about what's coming up next. So, the Hidden Bar is located in the Nova section, and it's between booth N26 and N27. There's a hallway there, and you, you kind of saw the picture, so you, you know how to find it. So what's happening next is um, the smallest comedy club in the world, Club Nuts. Um, it basically is a brick wall on... A microphone. A microphone. The brick wall is on canvas, a rep representation of a brick wall. And people can tell jokes. So we have some comedians that will be there that will be telling jokes. And we will have prizes 
for people who tell good jokes. And I th we thought that would be a really great way to end the fair. So there's a few hours where we can kind of just get together, have fun, have some laughs, and be in the oasis. I think that that's a good place to, to stop. So I hope you guys come with us to the bar. Thanks I guess man. it starts at three, so we might be a little early. So, you know, that's when the comedy will start. Cool. All right. Thank you. Yeah.